Hi, I'm Herb Gross, and welcome to lecture number 17 in Gateways to Algebra, where today we have a lot of vocabulary and hopefully unclearing some mindsets where we're going to talk about sets, functions, and graphs. And if those sound like far out terms, they're simply a more formal language used by mathematicians to discuss ideas that we've already discussed. Now, the concept of a set uh, is fairly straightforward. What is a set? It's a collection. But usually, it's more in mathematics, it's more than a collection. It's usually a collection for which we know how the collection is taking place. It has to be objective. And the problem is that sometimes things are not what they seem. Here's sort of a silly little question I made up. I'm thinking of a pattern by how these numbers are chosen, OK? In other words, uh, I have a formula in my mind. And using this formula, the first number is 1, the second number is 2, the third number is 3, the fourth number is 4. And based on what you see, you're supposed to pick the next number, OK? So look at that and pick the next number. I'm just wondering whether you happen to get 29 or not, OK? And the number after that, I think, comes out to be 126. Now, does that look kind of strange? You see, I promise you, I am thinking of a bona fide recipe in my mind that will guarantee this. But when you looked at this, somehow or other, just looking at the 1, 2, 3, and 4, didn't give you somehow the information of what's missing here. So let me just show you what, what recipe I was thinking of. Instead of talking about the first number, the second number, the third number, let's call it the nth number, where n could be 1, 2, 3, etc. And the way we're going to find the nth number is we start off with the value of n itself. And then what we're going to add on to it is whatever you get when you multiply 1 less than n by 2 less than n by 3 less than n by 4 less than n. In other words, let's suppose we started with the number 1. Suppose n was 1. That would give us a 1 over here, wouldn't it? But what would happen over here? If n were 1, wouldn't 1 minus 1 be 0? And isn't any number times 0, 0? In other words, if n were 1, that would make this factor over here 0, and that would make this whole expression here equal to 0. In fact, look what happens if n is 2. If n is 2, that would make n minus 2 equal to 0. And again, since 0 is one of the factors, this whole expression would be 0. If n were 3, n minus 3 would be 0. And if n were 4, n minus 4 would be 0. So look what happens. When n is 1, what do we get for our first number? 1 plus 0, which is 1. What do we get for our second number? 2 plus 0, which is 2. For our third number, 3 plus 0, which is still 3. For our fourth number, 4 plus 0, which is still 4, OK? Now, what happens now when we pick 5 for our number? If we pick 5 to be our number, look what happens over here. If n is 5, 5 minus 1 is 4. 5, five minus 2 is 3. 5 minus 3 is 2. And 5 minus 4 is 1. So now, all of a sudden, this number no longer drops out, but becomes what? 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 4 times 3 is 12 times 2 is 24, times 1 is still 24, and 24 plus 5 is 29. Uh, we don't have to do any more this way, but suppose instead of 5, we had picked 6 over here. If n were 6, then 6 minus 1 is 5, 6 minus 2 is 4, 6 minus 3 is 3, and 6 minus 4 is 2. And what do you get over here now? 5 times 4 is 20, times 3 is 60, times 2 is 120, plus 6 is 126. And so you see, what you have is a bunch of numbers that look like this. And what we do in math is when we have a list of numbers that we're going to call a set, we usually enclose them in brackets. I guess these are called braces. So we'd say what? The set consisting of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 29, and 126. Now, when you look at this, you say, what do you mean, and so forth? I don't see what comes after. When I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 29, and 126, I, I have no clue as to what comes next. So, so sometimes we give the definition more explicitly. We tell the person not what the members are, but what the test for membership is. See, what we might say is, this set is going to consist of all numbers of the form b sub n. In other words, the nth number b will be chosen by doing what? 
v sub n will be n plus the product n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 times n minus 4. Now, even though I haven't listed the members this way, suppose a person says to me, I wonder what the 10th number will be. Do you see the test for membership over here? What happens when n is 10? This is 10 plus what? 9 times 8 times 7 times 6. Now, I'm not going to bother doing this whole thing out, but could you now, well, let's do it out. It doesn't matter. Uh, let's see. 6 times 7 is 42. 42 times 8. If I make a small mistake, who cares? Because it's the method that's important, right? That's 336. Multiply that by 9. That's 4 carry the 5. Uh, 2 carry the 3. 30. Add on the 10. That's 3,034. The point is that I can figure out any number in this collection just by computing this for any given value. And that's called a well-defined set. And it's listed by a test for membership. Now, you may say, what does this have to do with what we've been doing so far? Well, indirectly, indirectly, every algebraic equation that we solved was finding what many mathematicians call a solution set. I just want to get you used to any, in other words, the problem with learning a course from one person is you can understand the concept. But if somebody uses a word that you're not used to, that can cause you a lot of grief. For example, this happened, let me see if I can do an illustration for you. Let me just get another piece of paper here, which isn't part of this lecture, but let me just show you something. Can you picture a little kid, say, uh, four years old, not knowing what the fraction two-thirds means? You say to a kid, you're the big brother, he's the little brother, why don't you keep two-thirds of the candy and give him one-third? That kid has no idea what you're talking about, but can he comprehend two for me One for him. See what I'm saying over here? Suppose you're divvying up candy. Two for me, one for him. Two for me, one for him. What are you doing? I'm keeping two pieces and giving away one. Isn't that the same as keeping two pieces out of every three? Well, two pieces out of every three is another way of saying two-thirds. What I'm saying is, is it possible that a student understands two for me, one for him, but doesn't understand what two-thirds means? It's like I can go up to a little kid and I say, which is bigger, 2 thirds or 7 fifteenths? The kid sees the 7 is bigger than the 2, the 15 is bigger than the 3. He says, oh, 7 fifteenths is bigger. But in concept, what does 7 fifteenths mean? It means 7 out of 15. So if I'm keeping 7 out of the 15, how many am I giving away? 8. Well, 7 for me, 8 for him, means I'm giving away more than I'm keeping. But 2 for me, 1 for him, means I'm keeping more. So if a person knows that 2 for me, 1 for him, is a better deal for me than seven for me, eight for him, but doesn't know that two-thirds is more than seven-fifteenths, that person doesn't have a math problem, they have a language problem. But if the only language we hear is two-thirds, we're not gonna notice that we have the language problem, we're just gonna get the problem wrong. So let me just at least teach you the vocabulary you're going to find in other books. For example, we've talked before about solve for x. Well, in the language of sets, we say what? The set of all x for which twice x minus 1 is 7. In other words, how, suppose you had never heard of sets. How would you solve this equation? You'd say, OK, I want to get the x's onto one side, the numbers onto the other side. So I'll add 1 to both sides. That gives me 2x equals 8. Now the x is being multiplied by 2. So to find the x by itself, I have to divide by 2. That tells me that x is 4. Let's check and see if that works. 2 times 4 is 8, minus 1 is 7. So what was this another name for? It was another name for the set whose only member is 7. In other words, what we did by algebra is we converted the so-called solution set from the implicit form in which, you, in which we tell you what property x has to obey into the explicit form in which we actually list the number itself. And the important point is that the test for membership is usually more important than what the members are. For example, if I say to you the set of all x where x is a prime number, what does a prime number mean? It means any number that's divisible only by one in itself, excluding the number one. So by testing, we can see what? That the prime numbers are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, etc. But if somebody gives us any number at all, and we don't see it on this list, will this test over here tell us how to determine whether this number is on the list or not on the list? And the answer is, yes, it will. And we can eventually test to see what? 
whether a member belongs to a set or whether it doesn't. Sometimes the test for membership is very stringent. For example, suppose I say to you the set of all x for which x plus 1 equals x plus 2. Well, if you try to solve that equation, that's what we did last time, and you subtract x from both sides, you wind up with 1 equals 2, which is always false. What this says is there is no number such that if you add 1 onto it, you get the same answer as if you added 2 onto it. This number here, in fact, will always be what? 1 more than this number. So therefore, even though this test for membership makes sense, it means what? It's so stringent that nothing survives it. So we give that set a special name. It's called the empty set. And that's the set with no members. And you see, what people will say to me is, if it's empty, why do we bother giving it a name? If there's nothing in it, why name it? And the important point is that it's not that there's nothing in it. It's that there was a test for membership that made sense, but nothing happened to survive it. It means that we had what? A test for membership that was so stringent that nothing could survive it. Which means what? If we want things to survive, we have to come up with a less stringent test for membership. Sometimes the test for membership is so simple that everything survives it. And that gives us the opposite of the empty set, something called the universal set. And let's take a look at that. The universal set, which is usually noted by i, is what if I said to you the set of all x such that x plus 1 equals 1 plus x? Well, for any number, isn't the number plus 1 the same as 1 plus that number? Suppose I try to see if 7 is in here. 7 plus 1 is certainly the same as 1 plus 7, so 7 would belong to this set. What if x was 2 and a half? 2 and a half plus 1 is the same as 1 plus 2 and a half, so uh, 2 and a half would belong to that set. Every number belongs to the universal set. No number belongs to the empty set. And sometimes it's important to specify where the set is coming from. Suppose I said to you the set of all numbers x such that what? x is more than 1, but less than 3. Suppose I think of it in terms of the length of a piece of string. See, for a piece of string to be more than 1 inch long, but less than 3 inches long, means that if the piece of string starts over here, it has to end where? Someplace in here. See, every number in between these two circles represents what? A number which is less than 3, but greater than 1. And that would be the geometric construction of the set A. On the other hand, suppose I told you that the only numbers we were allowed to look at were whole, were whole numbers. Suppose that was the case. See, suppose x has to be a whole number and it's between 1 and 3. Suppose I say to you, I'm thinking of a whole number, it's more than 1, but it's less than 3. That number has to be what? Only 2. That's the only number that works. So even the answer depends on what are we allowing to be tested? And I think in modern books, they refer to that as the replacement set for x. And I just want you to get used to that particular vocabulary. Also included in that vocabulary are some other words that we may use from time to time during this course. But I'm not going to become too much of a bug on that right now, because uh, we have other things to do. But let me just show you a few examples here. This would say what? A is the set consisting of what members? 1, 2, 3, 5, and 7. B is the set whose only members are 2, 3, and 5. And C is the set whose only members are 1, 2, 3, and 4. So let's take a look. Does 2 belong to the set A? Yeah, it's in there. So we write 2, and then this little script D, and that says that 2 belongs to A. 2 is an element of the set A. We also look at the set A, and 6 does not belong there. So we write what? 6 is not in A. Uh, by the way, uh, notice that every element that's in B also happens to be in A. Have you noticed that? There's a 2 here, a 2 here, there's a 3 here, a 3 here, there's a 5 here, and a 5 here. And, and what we say there is, is that, this, is that the set B is contained in the set A. B is called the subset of A because if you drew A as a picture, see here's A, and what's inside A? 1, 2, 3, 5, and 7. And you see inside A, here would be B. But you see, look at C. C consists of what? 1, 2, 3, and 4. The 1, 2, and the 3 are in here, but notice that the 4 is outside. So if you were trying to draw this, it doesn't look very easy. C, C would be what? Partly in A and partly outside of A. In fact, if you wanted to draw this thing schematically, are there any numbers that belong to all three of these sets? See, let's take a look. The number 1 belongs to A and to C, but it doesn't belong to B. 
the number two belongs to all three, the number three belongs to all three, the number five belongs to A and B, but it doesn't belong to C, the number seven belongs to A, but not to B and C, and the number four belongs to C, but to neither A nor B. And the way we sometimes illustrate this is in terms of a picture. This is called a Venn diagram, and this does for sets what graphing does for relationships, okay? See, for example, the way we draw this is, what does this show you? It shows you that inside the A circle are one, two, three, five, and seven. What's inside the C circle? One, two, three, and four. What's inside the B circle? Two, three, and five. And what else does it show you? It shows you that there's nothing inside the B circle that isn't already in either A or C, okay? See all these different things here? See, the two and the three belong to all three sets. How would you read this? Five is where? It's inside the A circle, it's inside the B circle, but it's not inside the C circle. Where is four? It's, in, it's inside the C circle, but it's not inside either the A or the B circle. And we do little things like this to sort of show people uh, more about sets. But again, this will play a role of sorts in our course because even when we don't mention sets, we're going to be dealing with them. See, when we talk about the input, isn't the input chosen from a set of numbers? And when we say, do something to the input, aren't we applying some rule to the input and won't the output then again be a number? Let's take a simple example. For example, suppose we want to find the area of a square. How do we do it? We start with the length of a side of the square, then we square it. That means we multiply it by itself, and the answer is the area. Let's take a look and see how subtly we use sets over here. When I said start with the length of a side, could that length be any old number? What's the smallest the length can be? Well, if you can't see it, it's not a length, is it? We're assuming that the number that we're going to pick is a positive number. And how long can the side be? It can be any length you want. So in other words, what's implied over here? That the set of inputs is restricted to what? Positive numbers. And what's the output going to be? If you square a positive number, it will also be a positive number. By the way, if, if we weren't saying we're going to find the area of a square, would we have to make this restriction here? In other words, if all I said to you was pick a number, square it, and write the answer, could then the number be negative? See, if I started with negative 3 and I squared it, the answer would still be positive 9. See, in other words, the answer would be positive numbers here regardless. But notice that the idea of how you have to restrict this set depends on the fact that you're looking for what? The area of a square. Now, by the way, again, let's use some shortcut notation over here. How would we write this? The input is x, and we might restrict this to x having to be positive if we're finding the area of a square. When we square it, what's the mathematical symbol for that? We write that as x squared. And then the answer, called the output, is y. So rather than write down, pick a number, square it, and write the answer, we simply write what? y equals x squared. And that's what we're used to. Now the problem is that mathematicians do this a different way. It's not wrong what we did, but they use a generic language. In other words, sometimes you'll be squaring, sometimes you'll be doubling, sometimes you'll be multiplying by 5 and adding 4. There are all kinds of programs you can be applying to the input. So the mathematician picks a generic name to indicate that he's doing something to the input. And let me show you what that is. See, what the mathematician does is he name, the input will generically, meaning for one, unless we specify to the contrary, will always be labeled by the letter X. The program will always be abbreviated by the letter F. And if there's more than one program on the problem, we might use G or H or something like this. And the output will be written in a very special way. See, we're used to calling it Y, but now the output is going to be written with the, pro with the program indicated and the input in parentheses. This is not f times x. This is written, and it's very strange, it's written f of, it's read f of x. In other words, the way you read this is that f is a rule that does a particular thing. It's a program that does something to the input. For example, if I wrote f of x was x squared, and by the way, if this is hard for you to understand, Leave the x out and just leave the parentheses in. If, for example, you want to see what, x, what happens when x is 4, put 4 in here, put 4 in here. See? If you want to see what happens when x is 3, put 3 here and 3 here. And what happens? 3 squared is 9. What this says is what? 
if the input is 3 and the program is the squaring program, that when you run the 3 through the program, the output is going to be 9. In other words, this very strange language is just another way of saying what? The input is x, the program is squaring, and the output is going to be named x squared. f is the rule that assigns to every number x its square x squared. Okay? And by the way, one of the ways we try to picture this is through graphing. In other words, very often what we'll do in math is, is we'll let the input, the input axis be horizontal, the output axis, see, the, the output axis be vertical. That's where the name y equals f of x comes from. And so when f of x is x squared, what we do is, is we look to see what the output will be for certain inputs. See, this says what? When x is 0, 0 squared will be 0. When x is 1, 1 squared will be 1. When x is negative 1, negative 1 squared is negative 1 times negative 1, which we know is positive 1. When x is 2, 2 squared is 4. When x is 3, 3 squared is 9. When x is a half, a half squared, a half times a half is 1 fourth. So what this tells you is what? When the input is 0, the output is 0. When the input is 1, the output is 1. When the input is negative 1, the output is 1, etc. Then what we can do is what? Locate those points in our xy, xy plane. See, this would be 0, 0, 1 over and 1 up, 2 over and 4 up, 3 over and 3 up, and all of a sudden we're getting what? A collection of points this way. And don't these points suggest a picture? In fact, I would, I would say that the picture looks something like this. And you see, once we know what that picture looks like, that gives us a better handle on how to handle the inputs and the outputs. You see, one way is to actually do what? Given the input, find the output. Or given the output, try to find the input. For example, suppose you knew the output was 25. If the output was 25, then that would say what? 25 equals x squared. To undo squaring, you take the square root. And the only thing you have to be careful about is that not only would x equal 5 be the right answer, but negative 5 times negative 5 is also 25. And so what that would tell you is when the output is 25, the input has to be either 5 or negative 5. But what graphing would tell you is if you want to see what input you need to get an output of 25, all you do is what? Locate the output over here, take your ruler, put it down, and see where it meets the curve. You see, if you start with the input, all you have to do is what? Go up to the curve, wherever the line meets the curve, then come over horizontally, and this says what? For this input, this will be the output. See, if you don't want to do algebra, you start with what? The output, come over to the curve, then come down and find the input. See, going from here to here is arithmetic, going from here to here is algebra, and yet geometrically, they're basically equivalent. In fact, to summarize this somewhat, and I think I have this done for you, let's just do a summary over here. When you write down y equals f of x, that's an abbreviation for saying what? x is the input, f is the program, and y is the output. You start with the input, run it through the program indicated by f, like if it said f of x equals x squared, it means that the program is squaring, Okay, the program is f, and the output is called f of x. Now I'm going to show you all of mathematics based on this little diagram. Arithmetic is when you have the input and the program, and you want to find the output. Algebra is when you have the output and the program, and you want to reconstruct the input. Graphing, which is also known as analytic geometry, is an interesting one. That's the one where if you know the input and the output, you want to find the program. See, what you do is, is you graph the input and the output in pairs, and that locates points, okay? And from those points, that will suggest a picture. And before I come to the final wrap-up, let me just emphasize one thing that's important about that. In the real world, we usually do not start with the relationship. The real world is basically what we call empirical. We're looking for evidence. We say, let's see what happens for this value. In other words, I'm going to do an experiment in the laboratory. So I increase the temperature. For this temperature, I find a certain height of a mercury column. For this temperature, I find another height. And what I'm finding is what? An input and the corresponding output. Input, output, input, output. When I have all of these things, I graph them. And looking at that graph, I say, does this suggest a picture 
that tells me something I wouldn't have noticed if I was just looking at these ordered pairs randomly. And see, from that picture, I can now get a relationship that I don't even have to know the algebraic relationship. See, for example, suppose I have a picture that this, I've plotted pairs, and I've now determined that the curve looks like this. I call this the y equals f of x curve. So if somebody gives me a value of x, all I do is what? Starting with that value of x, I project up to the curve, then go across, and this value, which I'll call y1, is the output. That's arithmetic, see, going from here to here. Algebra is somebody gives me the output. Starting with that output, I come across to the curve, come down here, and that gives me the input. And you see, so wh what bridges the gap between arithmetic and algebra? It's the graph. And all the graph does is what? It's arithmetic if you go from the x value to the y value. It's algebra if you're going from the y value to the x value. And look how easy this is to do once you're lucky enough to be able to draw the graph. In closing, there is one thing I should tell you, and that is in many real life situations, some crazy things can happen. See, what if you had a graph like this? This is kind of dangerous, because look at, for this value of x, if I pick x equal to zero, do you see that there are two y values over here? And you see, if I pick a value of y over here, can you see that there's going to be several x values at which this line crosses the curve? So the other thing that the mathematician does is he simplifies complex graphs by always drawing in the vertical tangent lines and the horizontal tangent lines with, wherever he can. And you see what this is going to do? Look, for example, between here and here on this curve. Even though this curve doubles back on everything, from here to here, isn't there only one place where, the, where a vertical line will cut the curve? You see, what happens is when you have a complex curve, all you do is what? Break it down into a bunch of smaller pieces, like from here to here behaves well, from here to here behaves well, from here to here behaves well, from here to here behaves well. And you see what I'm saying is, you take a piece like this, you take another piece like this, you take another piece like this, and what do all of these pieces have in common? That on any one of these pieces, an x value leads to only one y value, and a y value leads to only one x value. And that's why you'll find as you go along in the course, people will talk about these fancy terms called single-valued functions, one-to-one -one functions, and all the thing really means is that when you're given a smooth but complicated graph, you can always break it down into smaller pieces, and the more advanced the subject becomes, the more we're going to lean on the graph than we will on the algebra. And by the way, again, as I told you, if you don't like trial and error because it sounds like a baby term, what we call trial and error in grade school is called numerical analysis in graduate school. But at any rate, let's just stop here for now, and next time we'll pick up with some special nonlinear relationships, some other kinds of graphs and relationships. But until next time, study hard, have fun, stay young. See you soon.